Hello. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. So today we have a, a really fantastic speaker for everyone. Um, this is Dr. Andrew Newberg. Uh, Dr. Newberg is currently the research director at the Marcus Institute of Integrated Health at Thomas Jefferson University and Hospital in Philadelphia. He is a professor of the Department of Integrated Medicine and Nutritional Sciences with a secondary appointment in the Department of Radiology. He is board certified in internal medicine and nuclear medicine. He has actively pursued a number of neuroimaging research projects, which have been included in the study of aging and dementia, epilepsy, and other neurologic and psychiatric disorders. Dr. Newberg has been particularly involved in the study of mystical and religious experiences, a field referred to as neurotheology. He has also studied the more general mind-body relationship in both the clinical and research aspects of his career, including understanding the physiologic correlates of acupuncture therapy, meditation, and other types of alternative therapies. He has published over 250 peer-reviewed articles and chapters in brain function, brain imaging, and the study of religious and mystical experiences. He has published 14 books, which have been translated into 17 different languages. If everybody could just uh, welcome with a round of applause, Dr. Andrew Nugger. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay? You good? Okay. I don't know. With, with a welcome like that, I think I should do like a stand up routine or something like that. Um, wait, hold it. Oh, you have one. I got one. I'm good. All right. Well, um, so I'm very excited to be here and uh, very excited to be able to share with you some of the research I've been involved with over the last um, really 20 or 30 years of my life and career. Um, I've been very interested in the field of integrative medicine, so it's exciting to see FAU have their own integrative medicine center and uh, looking forward to doing a lot of collaborative work uh, with all of you uh, as we go down the future. But uh, I'm really here to just share kind of some of the more recent work that I've been involved in. A lot of what I do, as you heard in my introduction, uh, I, I have a background in nuclear medicine. So we do a lot of imaging studies, and that's very helpful for understanding the mechanisms of the body, mechanisms of disease and mechanisms of various therapeutic interventions. So if you're talking about a mind-body practice, 
if you're talking about diet and nutrition, talking about taking some kind of supplement, what's going on in the body? How is it affecting a person? How is it changing what's going on physiologically? And ultimately, how is that related to some kind of clinical improvement that they may have? So I'm going to uh, introduce this whole area and this whole topic and, and really just kind of cover a broad overview of things. But uh, certainly, uh, as we go through, if you uh, have anything, uh, any questions or anything, then let me know. Wait, I'm, is this, which one's moving this forward here? There we go. Okay. So I think, you know, from the perspective of what integrative medicine can be, one of the most important failings, if you will, and one of the most important future uh, approaches that we need to look at is how do we understand the mechanism of these different interventions that we might do? So for integrative approaches to become part of the kind of standard medical care that we give to our patients, we need to do a lot of research and we need to do clinical research. But again, I, I think it's very important to look at the mechanisms behind whatever clinical effects we may see. So we need to look at meditation practices. And if we're looking at that in the context of stress or anxiety, what's going on in the brain? If we're getting, if, if we're doing some kind of diet and nutrition uh, intervention, how is that affecting the gut? How is it affecting the brain? How is it, you know, what are, what are we looking at? And so a lot of the, you know, of course, on one level, the only thing we really care about is how do you feel, right? Are, are you feeling better or not? Are you feeling less anxious? Are you feeling less distressed? Are you feeling less pain? Uh, but we also, again, need to have some kind of physiological measure, and sometimes those physiological measures could be neuroimaging, and we'll be talking about that. Uh, immunological measures, what's going on in the immune system and different markers, biomarkers, and physiological measures as well. And again, that can be healthy, normal physiological measures like your heart rate, but it could also be abnormal measures that may have to do with abnormal heart rates or, or, uh, or various changes in your autonomic nervous system or something along those lines. So as I mentioned, um, I've been very involved in the field of, of imaging, particularly neuroimaging, and we have made use of a lot of the, the tools and technologies that we have. I understand you all, uh, through your clinical research unit, are going to be getting a, a very high-end uh, magnetic resonance imaging scanner, which is very exciting. Uh, I've done a lot of work with PET imaging, so positron emission tomography. Basically, that means that we're injecting some kind of radioactive tracer into the person, and we're looking at where it goes. And so we might inject a tracer like uh, fluorodeoxyglucose that looks at glucose metabolism. We might give a neurotransmitter analog and see where that goes. Uh, and again, we can do this in a variety of normal states uh, as well as abnormal states. So if somebody has inflammation, infection, cancer, uh, some type of abnormal function, they're developing Alzheimer's disease. Well, what's going on in the brain when you develop Alzheimer's disease? Is it affecting your acetylcholine receptors? Is it is affecting your me metabolic activity, the cerebral blood flow? Uh, are there disease markers that we might be able to look at? So as many of you may know, Alzheimer's, for example, to stick with that little discussion, um, there's an accumulation of amyloid protein in the brain. So can we develop a tracer that shows us where the amyloid is in the brain? Uh, if you have a disease like Parkinson's where you have abnormal dopamine function, can we look at the dopamine system of the brain and see what's happening there? And then if we decide to do an intervention to try to improve the dopamine areas of the brain, can we then pick that up using some kind of scan of some type? Uh, in integrative medicine, we do talk a lot about inflammation. We talk a lot about the immune system. We talk a lot about toxic exposures and so forth. Um, so we can use PET imaging to bind to various uh, molecules in the body to mimic certain molecules in the body that are involved in the inflammatory response, the immune response. Uh, we could potentially label various toxins and see where they go. And part of what, what, you know, that sounds like not such a great idea, but part of why that works is that when we do a PET scan, we're injecting a very, very tiny amount. We call it a tracer. So for example, if you wanted to see uh, where a particular, uh, uh, you know, organic molecule goes in the body, well, we can inject maybe like nanograms worth. So it's not going to have any physiological effect, but we can see where it goes. Did it go into the brain? Did it go into the liver? Where, where, what's going on? And ultimately, we hope that we can use these kinds of imaging studies to be able to determine prognosis and help direct therapy. For example, we might find out that if you have depression, uh, if you happen to also have inflammation in the gut, Maybe you're going to respond better to a diet and nutritional approach 
then for somebody who has depression who doesn't have inflammation in the gut, maybe we need to then put that person on an antidepressant. Or if we're going to put people on an antidepressant, maybe we need to know how much serotonin is going on and you know, do you have in your brain. And maybe somebody who's got normal serotonin, then giving them a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor medication like Prozac or Zoloft, that's not going to work that well. Uh, on the other hand, if they have low serotonin, maybe it will work. So we're hoping that we can use all of these different imaging approaches to not only understand normal processes, but disease processes and therapeutic interventions where we may ultimately be able to help diagnose and, and, and give us some prognosis and direct the therapies that people that we might be looking to give to people. So you're getting the MRI scanner. Um, so you don't have the ability to use some of these radioactive tracers, but that's okay. Functional MRI is extraordinarily valuable and does all kinds of great things. We can look at changes in, for example, cerebral blood flow in the normal state. I could take one of you in and I could have you do some task. I could have you study for your physiology test or something like that and see what areas of the brain turn on and maybe tell you who's going to do better or worse on the test. You may want to know about that. Uh, but, uh, but we also can look at all different kinds of variables in the brain. So Cerebral blood flow can be measured by a couple of specific techniques. One of them is called bold imaging. If you've ever come across an article or even, you know, like a New York Times piece or something like that about, you know, well, we found love in the brain or something, um, then usually they use bold imaging. It's blood oxygen level dependent imaging. And they're looking at the different paramagnetic molecules that have to do with hemoglobin that tell us something about how much blood flow is getting to a particular part of the brain. Uh, arterial spin labeling is actually something that got developed up at the University of Pennsylvania, where I was at for a number of years, uh, and got to know some of the folks who were developing this. Uh, this is a very interesting technique where, you know, if you sort of think a little bit, I don't know how much of you, you know about MRIs and how they work, but basically, you know, you shove people into a large magnetic field, and then you hit them with a little bit of a radio frequency pulse, and it deflects their, their protons in their body. Um, so where do you hit, where do you send that radio frequency pulse? Well, one approach is that you actually send the radio frequency pulse at the level of the neck. And then as the blood goes up through the carotids into the, into the brain, you can watch how it's getting back in line with the magnetic field. So that's called arterial spin labeling. And it actually allows us to look at blood flow where it gets up into the brain. And we can, again, we can look at what's going on in normal conditions, but then we can look at diseases. We can look at what happen, what's happening in people with depression, anxiety, Alzheimer's disease, whatever it is that you might want to look at. Uh, more recently, a lot of work has been done to look at something called functional connectivity, how different parts of the brain are working together. So we could look, for example, at you, maybe one of your brains and say, okay, you know, where, where, how is your frontal lobe and parietal lobe working? Are they kind of going up and down together or are they going you know, out of sync with each other? And maybe some places are supposed to do that. Maybe some are supposed to be together, but let's say the normal is to have the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe together. Okay, well now let's take maybe somebody who has autism and then we find out that they're not going together. Maybe they are going uh, in antithetical uh, angles to each other. So if that happens, well, maybe that's a way for us to understand part of the process of what's going on with their brain and why their brain may not be working the way it needs to. A few other approaches with MRI, one is called diffusion tensor imaging, which allows us to look at diffusion in the brain and helps us to look at the white matter tracks in the brain. So I think I have a picture of that in a minute, but um, that gives us an opportunity to look at where the different fibers are running in the brain. And again, we can look at a disease, for example, uh, you know, a big area of research these days is looking at concussion. You get a concussion, uh, you know, we have patients who come into our integrative medicine center all the time, and um, they say, you know, I, I, I can't concentrate, my mood is terrible. And you say, well, you know, let's do a brain scan. You get an MRI scan and the scan is normal. Um, so what does that mean? Well, maybe at the microstructural level, there are abnormalities, maybe different parts of the brain, even though they look okay, they're not connected properly. And so diffusion sensor imaging is a way of trying to look at that and try to help people figure out what's going wrong with the white matter tracks in the brain. Magnetic resonance spectroscopy. I understand that you're going to have a full package of magnetic resonance spectroscopy in the new MRI scanner. Uh, and that allows you to measure different molecules. So if you've ever had maybe a chemistry or a class back in college, um, sometimes you do MR spectroscopy to look at where molecules are or how much of the concentration of a molecule. Well, you can do that with the brain too. And so, for example, you could look at how much ATP there is in the brain and how much energy the brain has. Uh, we can look at, again, different neurotransmitters. There's a whole bunch of different molecules. In fact, one of the studies that we're doing, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, is a study where we're giving people an antioxidant. And well, the body's natural antioxidant is glutathione. 
And there's actually a way to do magnetic, magnetic resonance spectroscopy to see how much glutathione there is in the brain. So if we give them glutathione or we give them something as an antioxidant, are we improving the glutathione levels in the brain? We can check that out with magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And ultimately, as I talked about with the PET imaging, we can try to look at the therapeutic interventions, the mechanisms of the disease, the therapeutic interventions uh, help us to understand the prognosis for the disease and help us to direct therapies. So just to give you a little bit of an example of this, so this is uh, diffusion tensor imaging. So this is tractography. Uh, this was a fun little study that we did of people who were highly creative. Um, so we had people who were deemed to be very highly creative in various disciplines, and we looked at their brains, and then we compared them to people who were just kind of everyday creative people, um, which I always sort of felt like, I don't want to say, well, you know, you're, you're just not creative. Uh, we're all creative, but some people as, you know, there's, there's some Mozarts out there, and there's, uh, you know, uh, different, you know, artists and Michelangelo's out there. Uh, so, you know, what do you do with that? How do you figure out what's going on in their brain? And uh, these colors represent the fiber tracks that are connecting different parts of the brain. The colors represent the directional flow uh, of those fiber tracks. So the red are connecting the left and right hemispheres. Uh, I think the blue is, uh, is going uh, up and down, or front and back, and the green is going up and down. So we can look at that and we can try to make certain assessments. And for example, in this highly creative individual, I might be able to convince you that if you look at the left right hemisphere connections, there's a lot more red in here than there is in here. I mean, they're, they're, it's certainly there, but not as thick and not as much. That may make some sense, right? You know, you may have the ability to say, well, if your left and right hemispheres are communicating more with each other, um, you're going to be able to be more creative. Do you have a quick question? So, yeah, so, you know, again, we can start to look at all of this. I mean, how are the different parts connected? And, and we can start to quantify these types of things. So it's a good point. Now, we always have to be, these are all looking at different angles and so forth. So, you know, if I go up a little higher in a slice or something like that, it might look a little bit different. But yeah, exactly. You know, these are the kinds of things that we can start to look at. So in terms of some of the studies that we have done in the, in the world of integrative medicine and using our imaging techniques, but also looking at uh, different approaches uh, that integrative medicine has to offer, uh, I'm just going to go through some of the more recent studies that we've been involved in so you can get a feel for just the overall array of what might be possible. So we've done a, a Parkinson's disease study. Um, what we have been looking at, I was alluding to this a few minutes ago, that we can give people a very strong molecule that ultimately kind of functions as an antioxidant called N-acetylcysteine or NAC. Um, sometimes your patients might call it NAC, which I don't, that just doesn't sound right to me, but uh, I go with NAC. Uh, so NAC basically rejuvenates, if you will, the glutathione in your brain or, or in your body. Uh, one of the big questions, of course, is if we give, uh, if we give NAC, uh, does it get into the brain? And that's been one of the interesting discussions that we've been having about, you know, there, it comes in an oral capsule. Um, does, so, but that's got to get through your gut and liver and all that. Uh, we can give it intravenously. Uh, we've been working with a company who actually gives it intranasally. The idea that maybe if you give it through the nose, it'll get right up into the brain. So we're, we're doing studies to look at how much you need to give, what are the best routes, and does this actually change what's going on in the brain? But in our first study, where we gave it as a combination of intravenous and oral, we tried to do that to give a pretty good amount of, of NAC into the, into the body. Um, what we found was, was that uh, when we had the Parkinson's patients, that if we looked at what's called the UPDRS, the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, that looks at a whole variety of different symptoms that people have with Parkinson's, that we showed after about a three-month period of getting the NAC, that they had some improvements in their symptoms. They seemed to feel a little bit better, a little bit more energy. Uh, I'm not saying that people were dancing down the street after they received the NAC, but they did seem to be a little bit better, which for a neurodegenerative disease, which is a progressive process, having any kind of improvement was kind of intriguing to us. And we decided to look not just at how they were feeling, but we were doing some kind of brain imaging study. So we looked at the dopamine areas of the brain and similarly, we, we found improvements of about a 5 to 10% in terms of how much dopamine they seem to have in the brain. We're now doing a more advanced study where we're using our PET MRI scanner 
And we are going to be looking at not only the dopamine areas in the brain, but as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we're doing magnetic resonance spectroscopy so we can see how much their glutathione levels are changing. So is it, is it possible that the NAC just has some direct effect or is it doing what we think it's doing, which is increasing the amount of the antioxidant glutathione, which then helps to protect the brain better. So we're trying to take this all the way through the whole process. We give them the N-acetylcysteine. We see what the, the, um, the glutathione levels are in the brain. We see what the dopamine levels are in the brain and we see their clinical response. And if we can kind of match all of that up, then that means that we understand how this is working. What happens if they all get better, but their glutathione levels don't change? Well, so it's having a different kind of mechanistic effect than what we thought. And now we have to try to understand that. So there are different kinds of things that we can start to look at depending on how this particular tracer, uh, th this particular intervention seems to be working. Now, this was our poster child, so to speak, although I guess our poster adult in this case. Um, so this is one of the patients who really had a pretty substantial improvement with the N-acetylcysteine. And uh, here is the dopamine scan before. This was his Parkinson's disease scan the basal ganglia, which is the primary place where dopamine is in the brain and has a lot to do with motor function. And, uh, and that's why you get a lot of these motor symptoms, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, tremor and the um, rigidity and so forth and the hypokinesia. But after he received an acetylcysteine for about three months, um, there's a lot more dopamine in his brain. So that's pretty cool. Now, we didn't see this in all patients. And that is another issue that we have to ultimately talk about, as I mentioned in some of my earlier slides, Maybe we can do these scans to see where they are. Maybe certain people who have a certain amount of dopamine will be able to respond more effectively. Maybe if it's too low or too high, it's not going to have as much of an effect. So these are important questions for us to learn about as to why the N-acetylcysteine may work or why it may not work. But here was certainly a very interesting example of a patient who seemed to have a pretty significant response to the N-acetylcysteine. And of course, all of this is not just what we visualize, but we quantify all of this. So if you look at the amount of change that was going on in the dopamine areas of the brain, you can see that uh, in the, the group N, which is the N-acetylcysteine group, that there were positive increases in the uh, amount of dopamine in the brain, whereas in the control group, they just had that sort of overall progressive decline that seemed to be associated with the disease itself. And these were significant changes that we were able to explore. And there was a correlation uh, between the amount of increase in the dopamine areas that we saw and the reduction in symptoms. So that also was something that was uh, very interesting for us to look at. So as the dopamine went up in the caudate and putamen, then we see the, the negative correlation, which in this case is a good thing as the dopamine is going up, the clinical scores are going, the clinical symptoms are going down. And, uh, and that was something that was also significant and had a lot to do with what was going on in the dopamine areas of the brain, particularly the caudate and putamen. So as I mentioned, we said, oh, okay, this is kind of cool. We see some interesting results. We're encouraged by this, but we got a long way to go before we can truly know whether, you know, this is, we're not going to tell all of our neurology colleagues, hey, give all of your patients N-acetylcysteine. It works great. Um, so we need more data. And that's exactly what we're doing. We are trying to do a different kind of scan than the one I was just showing you, something called a fluoridopa scan, which is a PET tracer, fluoridopa, which has actually been around since the 1980s, but is not actually commercially available, but uh, we are able to produce it and use it. And we are also doing this in conjunction. We have a PET MRI scanner, so we are able to do both PET and MRI scans at the same time. So we're doing the PET, the PET scans with the fluoridopa. We're doing the MRI to look at the different changes in the glutathione levels. But we're also looking at other factors, including things like blood flow, as well as how different parts of the brain are connected with each other. And then we're going to do the clinical evaluation. So we're right in the middle of that right now. We're about 10 or 15 subjects in, and uh, we're ultimately shooting for about uh, 40 altogether. And we're hoping that if we get that data and that's confirmatory of our first study and also kind of shows that a whole line of what's going on, that this is really now going to start to make us feel more comfortable about what's going on and lead to hopefully bigger randomized controlled trials uh, that might be worthy of NIH funding and really try to find a way to convince people ultimately, yeah, hey, this really does work. We got to start putting patients on this, but we're not quite there yet. Oh, and actually, this is our first fluoridopus PET scan that we did at, uh, at Jefferson. So you can see in contrast to that other scan that we did, which is a slightly different kind of scan, 
that we get very good detail in the basal ganglia and we're able to look at uh, what's going on in terms of the disease status. In fact, in patients with Parkinson's, um, and this is now more mechanistically oriented, the disease actually moves posterior to anterior. So the heads of the caudate are here. These are the putamen. And you can see that the posterior parts of the putamen are not, they, they should all be as bright and they're not. So this is where the disease is starting. And you can see, and this is very common in Parkinson's, that one side looks worse than the other. And when one side looks worse than the other, the disease symptoms are usually manifested more on the contralateral side because the neuron, the neural fibers cross. And so uh, in this particular person, this is actually the left side of the scan. So this person has more symptoms on the right side of their body. And, but the other side is still being affected. So we can see kind of the whole disease process as it unfolds. Now we said, wow, this is pretty cool. We, we're getting some interesting results with Parkinson's. Um, you know, part of the whole point of N-acetylcysteine is that we're looking at oxidative damage. Well, it turns out that oxidative damage is kind of the end process of many, disease, uh, many diseases. So multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, maybe even concussions. So we said, well, maybe we should start looking at whether N-acetylcysteine can be useful in the context of other disorders. And so we were fortunate to get some funding to do a study of multiple sclerosis. Not sure exactly how familiar I are with all of these different diseases, but multiple sclerosis is a immunologically mediated disease where your immune system starts attacking your white matter. But ultimately the damage that gets caused is through oxidative stress. It releases these oxidative metabolites and then you destroy the white matter tracts, which then leads to the neurological deficits that the person has. So we said, well, let, so now this is in dopamine, so we don't have to do the dopamine areas of the brain. We can look at more global changes in the brain itself. So we decided to do a PET study looking at cerebral glucose metabolism. And that's important also because, again, I don't know how familiar you are with MS, but you get these lesions in the brain. And sometimes, you know, you can look at somebody's brain and you're seeing like this large lesion in the right side of the brain and they are completely asymptomatic from it. So it's just sitting in a place that doesn't seem to be bothering anything. On the other hand, sometimes people get it just in the wrong spot and suddenly they can't move their leg or they can't see or something like that. So it's not just where, the, it's not just what the lesion is or how many or how big, but it's where it is and what it's affecting. So by looking at glucose metabolism in the brain, we're not only just looking at the, the lesions themselves, but where, you know, what they're affecting. And we can start to look at that and try to understand how an intervention like N-acetylcysteine may be useful in telling us something about what it might do. So now this looks very different than those scans that I just showed. This looks, you're able to see more of the brain itself. This is a PET scan looking at fluorodeoxyglucose. So this is glucose metabolism. And the colors, kind of like with the, the prior scan, represent the level of activity. So these bright yellow areas are the most active, followed by the kind of more orangey, and then ultimately the blue and the black. So this scan on the left side is the person pre N-acetylcysteine with multiple sclerosis. And the area that we noticed here that looked a little bit lower compared to some of the other areas is what uh, this is part of the temporal lobe. And after we gave them N-acetylcysteine, now it's kind of brighter in this area of the temporal lobe. And we quantified it and we showed that there was increased activity in the temporal lobes in patients who were receiving the N-acetylcysteine. So that's kind of interesting, but what was even more interesting, we, we didn't really know how an acetylcysteine would affect people. So we asked people a lot of questions about the disease, about how they were affected by it. And it turned out that most of the patients said when, if they felt an improvement, that the improvement was in their cognition and in their memory. Well, that makes sense because this is exactly where the temporal lobe, that's what the temporal lobe is primarily involved in is memory and cognition. So we thought, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. So then we said, well, now maybe what we should do is do a little bit more of an analysis, not just quantitatively. You know, this, is, this is from the first study, where again, we see that there are significant increases in the N-acetylcysteine group. All these blue highlighted areas are the significant changes with increased metabolic activity, primarily in the temporal lobe, a little bit in the inferior frontal lobe, but these three areas of the temporal lobe. And then here was their cognition and attention scores also significantly improved whereas there wasn't much of a change in the control group. In fact, it actually went in the opposite direction. So, so again, we said, well, this is pretty interesting, but we just asked people how they felt. And they said, well, I think I, I feel like I'm concentrating better. 
but we don't know if they just felt that way or if it was a placebo effect or what was going on. So now in this next phase of our study, we're treating them for longer. We're doing the same FDG PET scans to look at the same areas of the brain. We're gonna do the magnetic resonance spectroscopy to see if we've changed the glutathione levels in the brain. And we're doing more formal clinical evaluations. So we're actually not just relying on what they tell us about their cognition, but we're actually doing cognitive testing. So we're looking at measure, direct measures of their memory, of their, uh, their, their verbal fluency, a whole bunch of neuropsychological measures. And then we can go back and start to correlate all these different you know, all these different measures to see if one, we actually are affecting a change. And two, if we are, is it because we're changing the brain in the way that we think that we are? So again, this is sort of how we can develop these studies to look at these kinds of questions. I mentioned uh, traumatic brain injury, TBI, concussions. Um, we get a lot of patients, and, and maybe some of you have, have even dealt with this on a personal level, uh, where you have gotten, you've had a head injury, and some people get a head injury, and, and a few days later, they feel great, and back, back to work, and back to play, and whatever they're doing. Other people wind up having persistent symptoms for long periods of time, and this particularly refers to people who have a little bit more serious injuries. So uh, this is a big problem, and as you know, it's gotten a lot of attention over the, over the last uh, five, 10 years. So we are looking at the mechanism of the injury. We're looking at a whole variety of different uh, imaging modalities, PET and MRI, to look at where in the brain there are abnormalities associated with patients who have persistent symptoms. And then we said, well, how can we mitigate this? Are there ways in which we can help people? Maybe we can change their diet and nutrition. Maybe we can give them N-acetylcysteine. And that became our next study here. So in our current study, what we do is we take people who have chronic symptoms from a TBI, they have to have symptoms for at least three months, and we put them into one of three arms. One of them is a diet and nutrition arm. So we spend a lot of detail going through their diet and nutrition. What are you eating? How do you eat it? What, you know, what, we try to find foods that they're eating that are pro-inflammatory foods. We try to make sure that they're getting enough nutrients. We try to get them to a more plant-based, more protein-based diet, a very healthful kind of diet. And then we tell them, you go follow that for the next three months, and we're going to see how you do. The second group gets the N-acetylcysteine in that intravenous and oral formulation. So we give them that for three months, and we see how they do. And then we have a control group, what we call our waitlist group. So um, actually, let me go past this. Uh, so this is a diffusion tensor imaging scan of people with Parkinson's, excuse me, of people with um, traumatic brain injury. And what we find is all of these red areas, these are the areas that are abnormal in people who have concussion and, and post-concussive symptoms compared to controls. So they don't have normal brains, but the problem is that you don't find this unless you do the diffusion tensor imaging scan. You only find it you only find it if you do that kind of a scan. If you just do a structural scan, their brain doesn't really look that much different. But they have all kinds of abnormalities, particularly in these kind of posterior areas of the brain, connecting the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe. And again, these are the cognitive and emotional areas of the brain that are very relevant. Even parts of the frontal lobe are affected. So we looked at this even before we started to put them through some of the different integrative medicine uh, therapeutic interventions. And then when we looked at the different areas of abnormality, we could find that there were different correlations with symptoms. So if they had abnormal, um, if they had abnormalities in their white matter, they were more likely to have abnormalities in different processes correlated with different neuropsychological tests. So here we were actually doing certain tests to look at uh, their memory, to look at how well their brain was functioning itself clinically. And we find all these little you know, lines, these purple lines that have arrows, these are correlations. So the worse they were doing from the perspective clinically, the worse their brain looked from the perspective of this diffusion tensor imaging. It's a very complex scan, but, but just to give you a feel for what we can do, I mean, you can really get into some incredible technology and look at these different kinds of changes that are going on in the brain that are associated with symptoms. Now what we can do is say, okay, well, if, if this is correlated, maybe we can change this. Maybe we can change this through their diet and nutrition. Um, maybe we can change this through uh, something like N-acetylcysteine. And, uh, and again, this is a, a yet another approach that we can use with functional neuroimaging. Uh, it's something called fractional amplitude of low frequency fluctuations or FALFF. Uh, it has to do with how the different, how their brain is kind of moving, so to speak. And we found all these red areas are abnormal in the concussion group. 
So we see a whole bunch of different physiological processes that are not working properly in patients who have persistent symptoms. And this is, again, it's just another marker of this. So these are the areas of the, um, the visual cortex. Um, these are parts of the areas of the posterior cingulate, which is very involved in memory processes and overall cognition. Um, so, and then even some of the uh, areas of the parietal and temporal lobe, these are some of the areas that are involved in social processing. And that's also one of the things that people come in with a lot, which is saying that, you know, they, they're, they're, they're having trouble with relationships and their personal interactions with people. Um, they can't read people's faces as well and things like that. So there's a lot of different things that are going on. If, you're, if your visual system is compromised, if your social areas are compromised, if your cognitive areas are compromised, you're going to have a lot of different symptoms. And this is exactly what we see in these kinds of individuals. Now, we're really right in the moment of analyzing the data, but I can tell you that we had some great responses in both of the treatment groups. There were people in the diet and nutrition group who did exceptionally well, and it really kind of changed their, their brain around, and they felt very, very good. We had people in the N-acetylcysteine group that seemed to do very, very well, and we are, uh, just, like I said, we're analyzing the data right now, so I don't have the actual results to tell you, uh, but we're certainly going to be looking at that, and we hope to be able to see exactly what's going on in terms of how their brain is responding to the therapeutic interventions that we're able to perform and do with them. So uh, we also had a study of sleep and uh, insomnia. I'm sure all of you are sleeping very well and soundly these days, uh, <laughs> and it's only going to get worse. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but we took some, uh, a whole bunch of people who had insomnia, and we found this very uh, interesting approach that uses auditory and vibratory stimulation. Uh, when do you fall asleep easily? Well, sometimes if you're on a long car ride or on a train ride or in an airplane, right, you got sort of that background noise, that white noise that's going on. You got a little bit of that rocking yourself to sleep, and out you go. So, um, you know, can we kind of re- capture that in some way. We have this special uh, sort of bed or chair that we call it, which does some vibrations and has uh, some auditory stimuli that are designed to kind of help ease the brain into sleep. Uh, people have really loved this particular intervention, but we wanted to see how this actually worked. Did it actually change their sleep? We gave them actigraphy watches to measure the actual hours of the sleep that they had. And we did a bunch of functional MRI studies to be able to see how they did. And we had the active group that received this auditory and vibratory stimulation. We just did it for one month just to see how it worked. And we had a control group to be able to evaluate as well. Uh, so, so some you know, very basic findings were that um, when we asked people just how they felt they were doing, their sleep index improved. That, that minus three is, is good. A higher score means that you're not sleeping as well. And the, the active group slept for more than 30 mi uh, extra minutes. I feel that isn't there like a sleep number bed now where they say people get extra 28 minutes of sleep or something. So um, but I don't know if they did this kind of study, but, but we did find, you know, with very specific markers of their, of their sleep that there were significant improvements in how their sleep actually worked. And then we were able to look at a variety of uh, brain scan studies to look at changes that were going on in this case, we were looking at functional connectivity, how different parts of the brain are kind of moving to with, with each other. And these different brain structures, areas of the cerebellum, like the vermis, uh, the sensory motor area, the thalamus, the cardiac, some of these are part of this, the sleep mechanisms in the brain. And part of these are also about cognitive and, uh, and memory processes. So people felt that they were sleeping better, but they also felt that they were kind of thinking more clearly and thinking better. And we saw very significant changes in the uh, functional connectivity between these different areas. Now, interestingly, um, some of them were increased. So sometimes increasing your functional connectivity is good. Uh, some of these were decreased because sometimes you might have, you know, for example, if you're over anxious about things and you're kind of focusing on stuff, uh, your frontal lobe and maybe your, your limbic areas are too connected with each other. And you need to kind of break that connection so that the person can kind of relax and, and feel a little bit less, uh, less anxious about things. So this is what we're able to demonstrate. We're able to see what's going on when you have insomnia, and then how is it changed by doing an intervention like this? So we have the ability to look at you know, the changes that are happening physiologically as well as clinically. Now, as we move a little bit more into the mind-body area, 
Uh, one of the interesting techniques that my boss, this Dr. Daniel Monti, has been working on over the years is something called the neuroemotional technique, which is a, a very interesting technique. As, as you know, I'm, I always call myself, I'm the brain imaging guy, so I don't really know the clinical piece that much. But, um, but NET is an integrative approach. It combines acupressure, cognitive therapy, uh, exposure therapy, you expose them to different traumas and things like that. And we did our initial study in cancer patients who had a lot of, of, of traumatic memories, uh, very distressing memories as a result of, of their cancer. And so what we would do is several different imaging approaches to try to assess how their brain was reacting and then how the neuroemotional technique would, would change. And I, was always, I always felt very badly about doing this study because one of the things that we would do is that we would put them into the MRI scanner and we created a, an, audio, an audio file that was a description of their trauma or at least their, their greatest, you know, their, what they consider to be their greatest trauma. So we would say, uh, maybe when they were sitting in there and we, we would hear it. So we would hear, I remember when you were in the doctor's office and you were sitting on that cold table and the doctor came in and told you that the can't, you know, there were some lymph nodes that were positive and now you were going to need chemotherapy and, and radiation. Th so you, they kind of relive this pretty horrible moment in their life, which I always sort of felt bad about that we had to do this to them. And I would very sheepishly get on, I could talk to them in the MRI scanner. And one of the things we were doing was seeing how distressed we made them. So on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling? And they would, you know, I'm feeling a nine out of 10. So I felt really badly about all of that. And then they'd come back after about a month of the neuroemotional technique. And I, how are you doing uh, on a scale of one to 10? And say, I'm, I'm good, I'm a two. Uh, feeling pretty good. Wow. Okay. So, um, so this was a technique that really seemed to be helping the patients in dealing with their traumatic memories. And now we've been trying to expand studies, looking at this neuroemotional technique in other circumstances and getting some very, very good results. But we did these MRI studies. So for example, when we looked at the, what area of their brain got stimulated, so now this was using um, arterial spin labeling for this study. So while they're listening to that traumatic memory, we're scanning their brain and we're looking at the areas of their brain that are active. And we compared this to a neutral condition, which was them listening to an audio file of a description of sort of a regular day. I got up in the morning, I had breakfast, I took a shower, I went to work. Um, so not a whole lot of emotional content there. And the area that got particularly active during the emotional trauma was this little, where the, hash, where these, um, uh, the, the um, crosshairs are, where you're seeing it right in the amygdala, right? This makes sense. So the amygdala is very involved in, in stress reactions, fearful reactions. So it turned on, you can see it kind of on all three angles there. So this was pre-NET. So then we bring them back again. We have them listen to the same neutral as well as traumatic um, audio. And we ask them to just you know, reflect on what they were listening to. So now when we look at the difference between the neutral and the stress state, what happened to their brain in that area? It went away. So bait, what this means is, is that when they were listening to their everyday waking up story, their brain was reacting the same as when they were listening to their traumatic memory story. So suddenly that traumatic memory is now just another day as opposed to a real trauma for them. And having you know, this little ability to show what's changing in the brain by doing that intervention is, is pretty interesting and kind of fun. And really going back to one of the points that I made in one of my early slides, when you talk about these integrative medicine techniques, it's kind of one thing if I parade a whole bunch of people up here and say, yeah, hey, neuroemotional technique is great. And you say, okay, well, that's, that's interesting. That's good. Um, but if I can tell you, hey, this is what we did to their brain. Well, suddenly there's this mechanism that gets tied to that and then starts to feel like there's really something that's happening. And so this is a great way to help the general medical world and community start to understand and appreciate what these different interventions do and how they work and what's going on to try to convince them that this may be a useful approach going forward for patients who have these kinds of issues and using these integrative approaches to help them with them. Again, we get a lot of quantitative data as well. So these were anxiety scores and, and uh, both state and trait anxiety scores and even depression scores. And for the most part, the neuroemotional technique group got significantly better. And I was very impressed by this because the NET is, like I said, it was, they got for about four or five sessions of this. It was over a period of about a month. So this was not some kind of psychoanalysis where you had to lie on a table and talk about how your mother didn't love you for 18 years before you started to feel better. After a month, it seems like it has a pretty substantial effect. And that's pretty interesting. One other little piece of information that we started to find was even more interesting was when we did some 
functional connectivity studies. So now we're looking at areas of the brain that are working together, right? Uh, one of the, and this was very interesting because from a methodological perspective, when we were doing that first, when we went to this scan, while you can't really see it, we were focusing in on the limbic area because that was what we thought. And, and the reason was, was that when we look at how the MRI scanner works, it gives us kind of a narrow window that we can actually work with. So we said, well, where, we, where do we want to put that window? Well, we'll put it right here over the limbic areas. But when we did the functional connectivity, we were able to include the whole brain. And the greatest functional connectivity change that we noticed as a result of going through the neuroemotional technique was between the amygdala and the vermis and other parts of the cerebellum. And we thought, well, that's kind of weird, right? I mean, I don't know how much you've had neuro, but usually we're taught that the cerebellum is basically involved in motor coordination. Okay, so what does motor coordination have to do with this? Well, it turns out as we started to do some research and more and more studies are starting to happen. In fact, our research, I think actually contributed to this as well. The cerebellum may not only be involved in the coordination of motor activity, but in the coordination of your emotional activity. And so the cerebellum may be very involved in emotional responses and particularly traumatic ones. So all of a sudden, this is starting to make a little bit more sense. Somehow, we don't fully understand all of the mechanisms, but somehow when you do the neuroemotional technique, the cerebellum may be regulating the amygdala response so that when we go to the other scan and we show that the amygdala doesn't react now as much as it did before, it's starting to put together a picture for us to understand how all of this is starting to happen in the brain. So we thought this was very interesting. And the idea that you can actually modify the cerebellum as part of an intervention, which incidentally also has something to do, as I mentioned before, with acupressure, so acupuncture kind of points. Um, there could be some very interesting things for us to be able to look at as we go forward. So as you also heard in my uh, introduction, I have been very interested in the study of various meditation and spiritual practices over the years. Uh, we have done a lot of studies of meditation practices. Mindfulness, of course, is a big one these days. Uh, we've studied other ones. Um, we did a mindfulness-based art therapy program. We did a study of a practice called Kirtan Kriya, which is a mantra-based practice, different moving meditations, yoga, and so forth. We've done studies of various prayer practices, including just kind of regular prayer versus very charismatic practices. One of my favorite studies was a study, I don't think I listed this here, but uh, of a study of a uh, practice called speaking in tongues. So if you're familiar with that from the Pentecostal Christian tradition, where they're, it looks like they're speaking, but, uh, but it doesn't seem to be an actual language. And while on one hand, I'm very interested in this just from the perspective of knowledge, it could also, we could think about how all of these might be useful from a clinical context as well, and to see what those mechanisms may be. So for example, we did a study of the mindfulness-based stress reduction program in an elderly population. So these are people who were maybe over the age of about 70, 75. Uh, the big question of whether you can you know, teach an old dog new tricks, and it turns out you can't. So it doesn't matter how old you are, but you can have a response to a practice like meditation, mindfulness. And uh, this was a very small study. This is a pilot study that we did, but we sent them through the mindfulness-based stress reduction program. They uh, attended the classes and um, they, they did the practice pretty well. There was a um, very significant change in a variety of different areas of the brain. So some of these areas, the uh, anterior cingulate cortex, the limbic system. So these are different areas, the temporal poles. These are areas of the brain that change. Now, this is one kind of funny story about this, uh, which bears just in terms of how studies get done. So we actually did this study. It was in 2020. Um, and it was, uh, we did the first scan of people and uh, this was, so this was all from like a, um, uh, I don't want to say a nursing home group, but uh, a, a, like a retirement community. So they were, all, like I said, they were all fairly old. And um, we did the first set of scans in September of 2020. And then they went through the eight week program and we brought them back in December. And this was probably one of the few meditation studies where everybody came back with far higher levels of anxiety and stress. Like, what, what's going on here? It was sandwiched around the election. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, these were people who, uh, were not happy with the way the election went and, uh, and were very distressed about things. And so, you know, this was one of the issues that, uh, you had to think about as to, you know, well, what's going on in these people's worlds and these people's lives. And, uh, and does that have any implications for how you start to interpret the results of the study? So, but anyway, um, 
Now, uh, this is a little bit more into the neurotheology realm, uh, as you heard also in my introduction. So this is where we're looking at the relationship between the brain and various religious and spiritual beliefs and experiences. So we ran an online survey uh, where we asked people about their most intense spiritual experiences, and we, asked, we gave them a, basically a blank page to write out whatever they wanted to, to write. But we also asked them questions about the experiences themselves, about how it affected them. Was it related to any specific issues, medical issues that they may have had, psychological issues that they may have had? And when we looked at the variety of these experiences, we found that we were actually able to categorize them into these different groups. So there were three main groups of experiences, what are called numinous experiences, which include uh, the sense of kind of connecting to a higher power, uh, if you will. Some of these could be revelatory, that you actually kind of learn something or feel something. They could be synchronicities, uh, which are what we talk about when we're talking about like coincidences so that you would then attribute to somebody making that coincidence happen. There could be a, another set of experiences, mystical experiences, which are profound sense of, of oneness or unity, losing your sense of self, for example, and very profound aesthetic experiences, looking at a beautiful sunset in the context of nature or perhaps even uh, artwork, uh, human-made artwork. And then interestingly, there are para, what we refer to as paranormal experiences that could be either known or unknown. What we mean by that is you know, a lot of times the paranormal experience may be like seeing a ghost, for example. And it might be the ghost of your, your spouse, or maybe just a ghost that you can't identify. And interestingly, you know, again, you say, well, what does this have to do with medicine or psychiatry or whatever? But you know, for, as one example, um, bereavement hallucinations, as they're referred to, that you see the spouse of, the, you know, you see the deceased spouse. Turns out that that occurs about 40 to 50% of the time in people who lose a spouse. And interestingly, what some of the data has also suggested is that when people have that kind of uh, experience that it actually has a positive effect on them because they feel closer to their spouse. They feel that, you know, they've transitioned into whatever's beyond and, uh, and they feel good about that. And what, what's interesting is that they, uh, they, they refer to it as, as a normal hallucination, which is a bit of an oxymoron if you think about it from that perspective. So, you know, you get into some really fascinating questions. Well, you know, what really happened? And I mean, obviously we can't, prove a whole lot here, but we can learn about what's going on with the people, what their descriptions are. And we've done brain scans of people who are engaged in practices like meditation and prayer, where they will have a sense of oneness, a sense of losing their self. Um, and we can talk about what that experience is uh, when we actually have looked at the response to these experiences. Um, well, this, this is actually just a uh, an idea about how common these different experiences are. So the numinous are, are certainly the most common. But um, uh, one of the things that we found is that these experiences really change people over time. And oftentimes people say that they their relationships get better, their, their fear of death gets better, um, their sense of well-being and purpose in life and so forth gets better. So if all of these things are happening, then Maybe there's something really going on in their brain. And we've done some longitudinal studies to look at different practices like meditation over time. I mentioned Kirtan Kriya. Um, this is a mantra-based practice where you repeat certain phrases over time. And this is a, a set of scans from one of our participants. So the A scan is their initial resting state. This is just their, what basically coming in uh, off the street and what their brain looks like. Then we teach them how to do the meditation practice, and they do this. We do the practice while they're they're. Excuse me, we do the scan while they're doing the practice. Then they come back eight weeks later after doing the practice on a daily basis, and we scan their brain at rest, and then we have them do the meditation for the final time. So a couple of really interesting changes. One is is that if you look where the arrow is, this is pointing to the thalamus, a very central structure. It involves a lot of sensory input, and also because of its central location, connects different parts of the brain to each other. And you can see that in the initial scan, it was a bit asymmetric. One side is a bit more metab uh, metabolically active than the other. But when they come back, it's much more equivalent. Maybe, I don't know if you can see this, but this side may be, even be a little bit more active and even more so when they're doing the meditation practice. The other change is in the frontal lobe. So their frontal lobe here is, is more red than what you see in their original baseline scan. And so because they're concentrating on this mantra, on, the, on these phrases, they actually are using their frontal lobes and it changes the way their frontal lobes actually operate. 
In fact, other studies have shown that long-term meditators have thicker frontal lobes than non-meditators. It's almost as if you're looking at meditation as a, as a exercise for your brain. So like when you lift a weight, your muscle becomes bigger and it becomes stronger. Well, your frontal lobes become bigger and this scan shows that they actually become stronger because they're more metabolically active and that correlates with improvements in attention and memory. So there's a lot of different changes that occur. And we even have found changes going back to one of the early studies that we're talking about with Parkinson's. These were healthy controls who went through a very intensive spiritual retreat and it changed the dopamine areas of their brain. So you can see that there's much sort of less activity here after the retreat than what they were doing before. So what was going on? Well, this is actually something called the dopamine transporter, which takes up excess dopamine in the brain if you block the dopamine transporter, you get a lot of dopamine in the brain. In fact, that's what happens when you give somebody cocaine. It blocks the dopamine transporter and they, they get that euphoria, they get that high. So if you're sort of blocking the transporter in a natural way, well, it makes the person more likely to get this euphoric high experience that could be considered a mystical experience and spiritual ecstasy, you know, what different terms people use. But we're starting to see a mechanism by which that may happen by looking at the changes that go on in the brain and how it sensitizes the brain. But people have also found that practices like meditation and prayer, lower uh, anxiety, lower depression. Um, this is actually the serotonin transporter, which also changed. So again, you know, if this is kind of blocking the serotonin transporter, so to speak, that's what the SSRI drugs do. That's what Prozac and so forth do. Maybe you're kind of doing this more naturally, and maybe this is a better way to help to manage people with depression, depending on the circumstances. So we've covered a lot of ground. Um, hopefully you've learned a little bit about what research in integrative medicine can be. Uh, we certainly hope that integrative medicine can help us to, uh, these kinds of research studies can help bring integrative medicine into the general medical world. We, we, as a lot of people will say, there really shouldn't be integrative medicine and regular medicine or whatever. I mean, it's, it's medicine. And we wanna be evidence-based. We wanna have the mechanistic data behind it. We wanna have the clinical information behind it. And hopefully all of this can help people to understand how things like diet and nutrition, stress management, uh, a healthy spiritual life, if that's important to a person, uh, all these different things can be useful both for physical findings, uh, as for physical issues, as well as uh, psychological and mental issues. And, uh, and we hope that this will help to establish the efficacy and the mechanism, but there are always a lot of future applications. We're still engaged now in more studies going forward. I know you all are going to get a lot of great studies going on here. Um, so there's a lot of work for all of us to do. And I uh, will leave it there and open it up for some questions. And if any of you want to, uh, feel free, what's that? Oh yeah, I have that QR code. Yeah. For that and and again, if you uh, yeah, do what you need to do there, <laughs> and and uh, and feel free. I, I've worked with a few of you already, and uh, certainly a lot of uh, we're hoping to do a lot of good collaborative work uh, with FAU going forward. So uh, happy to hear from any of you, and uh, just let me know who you are. So, got a question back there? It is. So what we, I mean, we call it our integrative medicine diet. Um, we kind of have developed that with our clinicians over time. It is probably the best way to describe it is a bit of a modified Mediterranean diet. Um, so it, you know, it's, it includes a, a, more, a higher protein, lower carb diet with uh, a lot of the good oils like olive oil. Um, we try to get them to a more plant-based diet, try to get away from certainly red meats, but um, you know, a, Lean meats like chicken and fish and so forth are okay, but in you know in in appropriate amounts. Uh, but but a lot of emphasis on on vegetables and uh, and plant based proteins and so forth. So we we have like a whole outline that we give them, but we do go over things specifically with them too. And we say you know what are, what are you eating? Okay, you have oatmeal for for breakfast. Well, you know oatmeal is not bad, but but it's basically a lot of carbs. And so you know can you try a protein shake or can you try uh, to get more vegetables? You know so we'll go into it in a lot of detail, but. You know, again, so we have our diet, but you know, future studies could look at things like the ketogenic diet, um, paleo diet. There's a lot of studies that are looking at these different dietary programs as well. Yeah. Uh, 
like he brings in like the what my dad calls the like, like the you know, the questions that we look at it and I guess the control of the people and see what they call or what they call. Yeah, so two great questions. Um the and the answer is they were they're good questions to to pursue. We haven't done that yet. Uh the um uh, you know, we certainly could, I think the way we thought about it in general is, and, and this is also an interesting, let me answer this in a, in a broader context of integrative medicine. So in integrative medicine, we often take a very kind of multifaceted, multi-pronged approach to the patient because we say, well, we need to treat your biological self, the psychological self, social self, and so forth. Um, so, you know, thinking about ways of combining therapies across different domains can be very, very helpful and and so for example like with the concussion study like if you were to come into uh, to see us we would work on your diet and nutrition but we would give you an acetylcysteine and we would probably help you do a meditation program so our institutional review board said well but if you do that and they get better how do you know which one's working so then we have to say well now we got to break it out so that's part of why we wound up doing that with the hope that well, okay you know did did the nutrition help okay did the you know did the nac help and so once we show that those individual therapies help, then we can start to find ways of, of merging them with others and, and seeing what other options might be out there. And uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing that we are gonna be doing too is, is bringing in more of, well, how do any of these interventions affect a control? You know, how, are, are, they, are they changing metabolic activity? Uh, one of the, the downsides of always working with controls is, is you want it with either a floor or ceiling effect. So if they have normal metabolism to begin with, we can't make their metabolism more normal. You know, um, if their memory is 95th percentile, I'm not going to make them, you know, 195th, you know, so, so you're not, you know, the part of the advantage with the concussion group is their, their cognition is at the 65th percentile. So now I can see if it goes up to 75 or 85, but if you sort of start at a certain level in normals, it's, it's harder to tell. And, but that whole issue about controls is a really fascinating methodological challenge in the context of integrative medicine. It comes up a lot with the whole diet and nutrition piece because we all have to eat. So now, you know, if I tell you to eat more vegetables, um, what exactly does that mean? And, and actually, if you look at a lot of the studies, you know, you've probably seen some of these studies come out in JAMA where they give people like vitamin D and it says, well, it doesn't work. Well, the problem is that they never checked whether they had low levels to begin with. So if, if I give all of you vitamin D, but half of you or, or three quarters of you have a normal vitamin D level, well, it's probably not going to help you all whole much. If I focus on only the people who have low amounts of a particular nutrient, then I might be able to see much more of an effect. So these are important questions for us to look at. Is there anything remotely? Yeah, sure. Okay. Any, yep. Well, I mean, we do know that N-acetylcysteine is able to basically take glutathione, which has been broken down by oxidative stress, and it, re, it basically rejuvenates it. So it goes through a metabolic uh, a chemical process where it enables it to now be, be able to be used again by the body. So we know that happens, but whether we're making that happen in the brain and whether that ultimately leads to the change in metabolism or the, the, the theory that we have with a lot of these is that, you know, like if you have uh, Parkinson's disease, well, if the neuron is dead, it's dead. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to get that back. But if you think about what's going on, let, let's say you have Parkinson's, maybe you have 30% of your neurons are dead, 30% are fine, and 30% are dying. Well, maybe that's the 30% we can work with. And so if they are dying through this process, if we can help to reestablish a better oxidative uh, stress level in the brain, then maybe we can preserve them or prevent them from dying. And, and other data has shown that a lot of these disorders like MS and concussion and PD um, all have lower levels of glutathione in the brain. So then that's, you know, that's sort of where the whole sort of mechanistic thought process goes, but whether we can do it and whether, whether that uh, metabolic, uh, the, the oxidative stress problem in the brain is kind of you know, along for the ride or directly related and whether we can get to the point where, you know, the, the, where it's actually happening, you know, that those will be the big questions going forward. It reminded me of transcendental meditation, which requires two 20 minute practices a day. And we right. see a lot of patients fall off of that because they're just not able to 
Or yeah, no, it's a really interesting point. Um, and and there, there's a couple of ways of answering it, but I, I, the short answer is, is that you what most data has shown is that the longer you do meditation practices as a general statement, typically the more of an effect you will have. However, what studies have also shown is that very short amounts of meditation can be effective. So if you, you know, I mean, if you're about to go in and, and take your final exam and you just sit at your desk for 30 seconds or 60 seconds and take some deep breaths or say a mantra or whatever, um, you will lower your stress level. And so, the, you know, even with very short bursts, so to speak, or I don't know, burst is the right word for meditation, but very short uh, time spans of meditation, you can see some effect. But typically, the longer you do it, and and you know some of these long-term studies, these are people who have been doing these practices for 20, 30 years or something like that. So uh, the more you do it and the longer you do it, the more the effect is, but short spans of time will also have an effect. And then the flip question, which we don't really know yet, uh, although there have been a few studies that have looked at it, is if you say, okay, I'm stopping today, you know, what, what's the sort of the pharmacological washout uh, of meditation and, and how how quickly do you kind of go back to the normal state of your body, whatever that is. And, and we don't know, but, um, but yeah, those are, it's a very interesting and very important point. All right. Oh yeah. Sorry. Um, so you have different yeah. Well, so, I mean, we, again, we're trying to look for, we try to design our initial studies in, I would say like the easiest way, meaning like the, the most simplistic look for the, the signal that we want to find. If we find that these interventions are useful in these patients with post-concussion syndrome, um, then we can start to look at uh, other aspects. It, and, and the same is true. You know, one of the other larger questions is when do you treat? So if we take a Parkinson's patient, for example, or, uh, or an MS patient, uh, is, it, is it okay to treat them when they've had the disease for five or six years, or is it already, you know, these interventions are no longer going to be valuable. Um, when I first develop somebody, you know, first somebody first comes in and they have a little bit of a tremor and they're diagnosed with Parkinson's, maybe that's the best time to do the intervention. And with multiple sclerosis, part of the way that it works, as you may know, is that you usually have these episodes, so to speak, or these acute uh, changes that occur because that's when you get this immunological response. So a person kind of goes along and then all of a sudden they, they wind up in an episode that they have a, a severe deficit. Sometimes they recover some functions, sometimes they don't. And then they, they, they keep, you know, it depends on the circumstances. So maybe you want to get, we're doing all of them kind of in their stable state, even though they have MS, but maybe getting them right at that moment where they're, they're having an exacerbation would be better. And the same thing with the concussion group. So is it, is it, better to, you know, as soon as somebody gets hit on the field, that we give them N-acetylcysteine? Or is it better to wait and see how they do? Is it okay to give somebody uh, uh, N-acetylcysteine after five years down the road after a concussion? And we don't know the, the full answers yet, but, but that's what we'll be looking at. Any others? All right. Great. Thank you. Put my email up in case anybody wants that.